I'm a writer and a researcher with a consuming passion for the untold stories of Bletchley Park in World War II. I got interested in Bletchley Park through a work of fiction, and it's really good now because of the new film, The Imitation Game, a lot more people are becoming aware of Bletchley Park, and that story becomes greater known worldwide. Today I want to talk to you about a couple of the women co-breakers at Bletchley Park. And I always like to start sort of like a scene of a film. 1946, the gates of Bletchley Park are closing. 9,800 people have walked through that park and surrounding outstations throughout the war. Of those, 6,600 were women, 4,000 were civilians, quite often well, service personnel, and quite often they had just come out of school when they enlisted. At, the, at that time, people went back to 1946, the gates are closing, and out come three astonishing women. They are Margaret Rock, Mavis Lever, and Joan Clark. They each um, spent time at Bletchley Park. They arrived in April 1940, and it gave them the chance to really explore their potential. Mavis met her husband there. I picture her standing there with Keith Beatty, her husband. Joan stands there looking over her shoulder, and she pictures the lost love, the, the thing that actually became to define her in history, and that was her relationship with Alan Turing. But that was, she was so much more than that. And then Margaret Rock, a mathematician who was 36 when she turned up at Bletchley Park. But she had tasted this freedom that she hadn't had before, and she wasn't going to go back to live with her widowed mother. She was going to go on, and she was going to pursue her career in co-breaking with the government communications headquarters at its post-war um, organization at Eastcote. While researching these women, I, enter, I identified some key things that were very similar between them. And the first one was strong, supportive families. Margaret, who was the oldest of the, the three women who, who went to Bletchley, her parents really supported her and her father while he was fighting in World War I. He would write to her while she was at school and say, never give up, do your best. She would send her homework to him to, to have a look at. Mavis's family sort of were amazing. She became interested in German. And rather than go on their holiday to Bournemouth, where they went every, every year, in 1936, they went to Germany. They got some cheap tickets on a, a German steamer um, used to give German workers holidays um, because the authorities felt that a happy German worker was a productive German worker. And there, while she soaked up the, um, the stories of um, German myths and legends, she became interested in the German language. Joan's family, she came from a, um, a religious background. Her father was a clergyman. He was quite austere, but he was also very forward-thinking. She was the, the youngest of five children, and unfortunately, her a brother, the, the fourth child, he died. And the family felt that, you know, they had to support the children in all the things they wanted to do. And it wasn't just academic study. They were interested in art. And he would come and pick up the children on Sundays and take them to the theatres and the art galleries in London to really explore that side of it. And for anybody who's seen The Imitation Game, it sort of showed Joan's family as not being very keen about her going to Bletchley. But that was not the case. An example of that is um, her sister was a talented artist and she was allowed to, to go to art college rather than the traditional academic university and also to, to emigrate to Canada after the war. So they were really good at pushing forward their interests and that was really key at a time when so few women went through the school process and then continued on to university. All women also had strong, supportive school network. Um, Margaret, she went to a, a Portsmouth High School, and that was a girls' day trust school. And that had been founded on very strong ethos of giving um, the, 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 
the girls of working businessmen and education. Um, Mavis Jones School was also started out as a girls' day trust school, uh, but that then got taken over by the church's school company, and it continued with that strong belief in education for women, as well as uh, the strong religious moral upbringing. Mavis also had a religious upbringing. Her family sent her to a convent school, even though they weren't Catholic. But they, were, they recognized the intelligence of their creative and imaginative Mavis and, want, and, and approved of the school and wanted to send her uh, to, to get the best education they, they could. They all then went to university. And it's really interesting to see the school boards, um, you know, where they show the scholars. And, and at the time, you'd see one or two names going on um, to do university degrees. Margaret and Joan went on to do mathematics, and Mavis went on to do German. And of course, all this led on to their work. At the time, they weren't really sure what they wanted to do. Quite often, the roles were teach. And Margaret, who, who was the oldest, she'd already gone into the workforce, and she'd become a statistician. And she didn't want to teach at the time, but there, there was no real kind of direction. She did a bit of work, but she was also there as the main primary support role for, for her mother. Joan was studying mathematics when, brought, when war broke out, as, and Mavis was studying German literature. Um, Joan was able to complete um, her degree. She did the mathematics tripos at Cambridge University, and she came out with a double first. And she was recruited um, to Bletchley Park by her geometry professor, Gordon Welshman. Mavis, she abandoned her studies, so she was the only one of the three who didn't complete her course, but she decided she needed to do something more for the war effort. And she said to her tutors, I think I'll be a nurse. And they said, oh, no, you won't. You've got German. We'll send you to the foreign office and see what they can do for you. And it just so happened that one of her professors was an old World War I codebreaker himself. So he had his eye on all the potential candidates that could work for the Foreign Office and be sent to Bletchley Park. M Margaret's path to Bletchley was slightly different. Um, her, it, it's connected to her brother, who'd been over as part of the British Expeditionary Force in France since October 1939. And she wrote to him about her application being delayed, and, and so he had a word with his colleague. And within a month, she was at Bletchley Park. So when Churchill said, Left no, leave no stone unturned to find candidates for Bletchley Park, well, I don't think he was expecting it to, to make it all, all its way to France. And so they all arrived at Bletchley Park. Mavis and Margaret ended up working with Dilly Knox. And this was actually fabulous for them. Because it was, there was a bit of a joke at Bletchley Park at the time. Oh, Dilly's girls, he'll only work with women. But actually, he was really progressive. He was quite an eccentric, old World War I co-breaker. But he wanted to work with women because he, could, he knew that he, he could mould them and he could let them fly. And that's exactly what he did with Margaret and Mavis. He let them really um, reach their potential. And within that, they, they excelled and, and they became senior co-breakers in their own right. Because a lot of Bletchley Park was compartmentalized. And so you got a job, you stayed in that job. There wasn't that much progression, unless you were sort of one of the senior male co-breakers. And they, to a degree, they sometimes moved between departments. For Margaret and Mavis, the key, the key aspects of their works were... Um, very old school. Other parts of Bletchley had industrialized the process using the bomb machine. But for those nine women with Dilly in the cottage, it was pencils and paper. They broke the German Enigma machine with its extraordinary number of possible settings with pen pencils and papers, which I find quite astonishing. Joan, she arrived at Bletchley Park expecting to work in Hut 6 with her professor, but was actually collected by Alan Turing and taken to Hut 8. In Hut 8, as you may know, um, was where they broke the complex naval enigma code. 
It was very complex because whereas some of the other Enigma machines, they could do some guesses about its settings, but the naval one was different, that all the settings for the machine were set out, and so they couldn't guess it. They had to rely on material taken from boats and U-boats to really be able to have a break, to build up their knowledge of the sort of messages they could, so they could use uh, techniques developed by Alan Turing, such as cribbing and bambrismus. Margaret and um, Mavis, the key, um, the, the, the key success in their department was the Abwehr Enigma, and that was the German military intelligence Enigma machine. And what breaking that did, it gave us the chance to see the German spies and the messages they were sent to Hitler. So what we were doing is we were turning German spies that had come over to this country. We were then um, giving them misinformation that was then being fed back to Hitler. And the key one was about the D-Day deception, where we were planning to land when we attacked France. And um, we could see by deciphering those messages just how successful that they were believing Hitler and his commanders were believing those messages. And it gave us that advantage for D-Day. And that was such a si significant turn in the war. As we know, the U-boats um, breaks in Hut 8, they were able to save valuable resources from being sunk by those predatory U-boats. Joan's story was she, she was recruited and she had to sort of go through a more traditional way, whereas Mavis and Margaret, they were sort of celebrated at each success they had. Joan had to really kind of go through the ranks through perseverance. She actually became the longest member, serving member in her Tate. And in early 1944, she became the deputy head of her Tate, which was, she was the only woman to receive such a, a senior rank in a cryptographic role at Bletchley Park throughout its whole time there. At the end of the war, suddenly these three women had a career that they, they enjoyed, they really excelled at, and they could go on to. And all three went with government code government communication headquarters to East Coast and then on to um, Cheltenham. At the time, as I say, there was nearly 9,000 people at Bletchley and its outstations, but the government communications headquarters team was going to be 1,000, and they wanted the keenest minds. So it was a good tribute to them to show that they were up there to have been selected um, to, to go on. And Mavis left when she became pregnant, and she then became a very significant figure in garden and landscape history. Margaret and Mavis continued at gov government communications headquarters, Margaret till the 60s, and Joan until the 80s. And so this is why both of those women didn't really tell their story at the time, because they, they, they were bound by this sort of secret for, for most of their life. And if you speak to any of the veterans now, they still find it hard to talk. They kept the secret for so long. So many of their families ne died never knowing their stories. But Bletchley was in that extraordinary circumstances of war. It really gave them that opportunity um, to, to excel. But of course, all that is, is you know, irrelevant without potential. And these women had potential. And it's interesting, isn't it, when you think of those four things family, school, work, and potential. Opportunities for women have changed now. There is so much more. But those four cornerstones are still relevant now, aren't they? And, and it's events like uh, InspireFest that give us the opportunity uh, as parents, as colleagues, as employees, and as educators to get the next generation interested, to explore their potential, to be able to reach them and face the challenges of the future. Uh, I, I'm friends with um, a Bletchley Park veteran called Charlotte Webb, and in the Queen's Birthdays honour, she's been awarded the MBE. And she's amazing. She's 92, and she's done over 100 talks about Bletchley Park. She continues now into her 90s, inspiring people and sharing the story of Bletchley Park. I hope um, what I've told you today in inspires you to read a bit more about it. And what I've done is you can go to my website, Bletchley Park Research. Uh, I
uh, forward slash inspire, and if you use the password hash inspire me to access the page, you can download some handwritten letters from Margaret and Joan. When I discovered their papers, I spent days, hours, just looking through their, their papers and their letters and their photographs, and it's just such a huge buzz to sort of really get inside their lives. And I wanted to be able to give a flavor of that. Margaret talks about being caught in um, a, a bombing raid in, in, Ble uh, in London, getting back to Bletchley. And Joan talks a little about the bomb machine and also um, Alan Turing. So please um, go on, have a look, uh, and read their letters in their own words, their own handwriting. It's, it's fantastic. Thank you very much.